Okay. So whilst I'm recording, the slides come out slightly differently, but that's okay. So, um, so what I'm going to do now is just run through some of the background ideas for the kind of empirical work on the acquisition of uh, symbolic maths, certainly, and reading. So I'll start with maths. So the Ansari paper is quite short and dense, goes through a lot of studies, but the kind of central points that you can take from that are that, well, there's been an awful lot of research that shows that very basic kinds of sense of quantity, sense of number, um, appear to have a long evolutionary history. They appear to be numerosity judgments, judging accurately, for example, quantities less than four. Lots of creatures appear to be able to do this. Even a little salamander like this can tell the difference between a pile of two dead flies and three dead flies. Now, of course, salamanders can't count. They don't have a number system. But they have basic neuronal detectors systems that can discriminate between more than and less than effectively. Right? So this has been called by Stanislas de Haan, famous cognitive neuroscientist, the number sense. So the idea is that we would have at least some, some, an, some kind of innate sense of quantity, magnitude, at the very least. And in other kinds of animals, in uh, studies on tuning frequencies in neurons, in uh, usually studies on monkeys, rhesus monkeys, for example, what we find is that particular neurons in the intraparietal sulcus, in the parietal lobe, tend to peak in their firing rates at the presentation of particular kinds of, in this case, non-numeric numbers, quantities. But this is not a discrete function. This is a kind of continuous function, right? In the sense that uh, nearby neurons that are tuning and coding for other numerosities, nearby numerosities, will also fire to a certain degree. So if you have a neuron that is coding for two, say, then when you present it with three and one, it will also activate. So it's not a discrete on and off type function. There's a certain amount of noisiness, there's a certain amount of stochasticity in the, in the function. And these kinds of uh, studies are supposed to show that there's something like a homologue, right? There's, uh, this is homologous between primates, such as rhesus, and ourselves. So the same kind of studies can be done on humans to show that we have the same kind of noisy neurons that, before we learn anything about maths, will fire at the presentation of certain kinds of um, quantities or numerosities, right? So one of the things that's important is that whatever the evolutionary endowment is that we have and that we share with other animals, it's an approximate function, not a discrete one. Right? So a lot of the discussion in the Ansari paper is about this distinction. Right? So part of the idea in the traditional literature is that you start off with this kind of mental number line start off with this very basic sense of, um, of number and continuity, cardinality. And that basic structure is what is built upon when we learn discrete symbolic mathematics, when we learn a number system and we begin to learn arithmetic. So one of the ideas is that 
numerals and numbers in mathematics are mapped onto these kinds of tuning curves in banks of neurons in the intraparietal sulcus. Right? So the kind of approximate sense of number, that's what our symbolic numbers get mapped onto. So our sort of approximate sense of number, approximate sense of magnitude, is what forms the kind of basis of our understanding then of learning one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. So the standard approach is that there's a mapping there. So we have a kind of core cognitive module, as it were, something like a module anyway, something specialized for number. We have a core cognitive system for numerosity, which is then built upon by acquiring a symbol system and rules for transforming numbers, algorithms, and so on. Right. So this is fairly straightforwardly um, demonstrated. So we can do this in terms of subitizing, which is something that Louis is very interested in. You can just look at these two boxes. This hasn't come out very well because um, it's small. But this is box A, this is box B. You don't need to do any formal counting to be able to tell that B's got more dots in it than A. You can just look, subitize. You can just tell that B has more dots than A. Everyone can do that pretty much unless they've got some kind of, some kind of problem. Very basic capacity, everyone can do it. However, if you want to tell whether C or D has more dots in it, some people can do this just by looking, don't count. Just by looking, uh, some people can tell that C or D has more in it, but most can't. They would have to count. Supertizing only gets you so far. Supertizing is a set you can just tell whether, in this case, there's more in one box than another. But for most people, they can't do that, and therefore they have to count. So the approximate system for capacities like estimation, uh, supertizing, and so on, only gets you so far. And it's only designed to get you so far, because it's not much use to have uh, a supertizing capacity for being able to tell whether there are 10,000 dots in here or 9,000 dots in here. We know that some savants can do very odd things like this, but for most of us we can't, and that's because there aren't very many occasions where it would be useful in the wild, as it were. However, if I just leave that up there for a second, you can look at me in a puzzled way, no one's hollering. Look, of course said, you reject that result, I can't be right. 34 plus 47 isn't 268. Why not? Because the proposed quantity, proposed quantity is too distant from the operands of the addition. Right? So it certainly appears to be the case that the so-called distance effect, the idea of magnitudes spread out spatially, is one that still appears to be placed, at least in some, some of the time, in discrete arithmetical computations. Right? We don't need to add 34 and 47 together to tell that they can't be 268. We just know that's, that's nowhere near, as it were, right? Lots of spatial metaphors in maths. It's, not, it's nowhere near the, the correct answer. However, Now, I take it, if you're someone who does a lot of mental maths, you might be able to tell whether that's right or not without thinking too much about it. But for most of us, there's no way we'll really know just by looking at it in the way that we do with this. We can't really tell whether that's close or far away for most of us, in which case we do actually have to resort to. So approximation involving distance, isn't going to help here. You're going to resort to actual multiplication. You're going to write it out and work it out, or you can use your calculator or 
ask a friend or whatever. So there are important differences then between these number sense style, approximate style, um, cognitive capacities, and the ones that we develop to do discrete mathematics and arithmetic, right? Now, the claim is that in most of the, li the existing literature is that the two are supposed to map onto each other. So our capacity to do this is supposed to map onto the capacities that allow us to do this, or to be able to tell just by looking that this is wrong because of the distance. Right. But as Ansari's article points out, there's quite a lot of evidence that shows that perhaps that's not the right way to go about things. That actually being able to do this is a different kind of capacity from being able to do this or this. Right. So from being able to do the subitizing or the distance type estimation in the addition. So Dahan, Stanislas Dahan again, who spent a lot of his early career working on arithmetical cognition, mathematical cognition, um, about 10 years ago now said this, which is quite an interesting quote. The model that emerges suggests that we all possess an intuition about numbers and a sense of quantities and of their additive nature. Upon this central kernel of understanding are grafted the arbitrary cultural symbols of words and numbers. The arithmetic intuition that we inherit through evolution is continuous and approximate. Right? That's what the monotonic effects are that Ansari talks about in his paper, continuous. The learning of words and numbers makes it digital and precise. <clears throat> Symbols give us access to sequential algorithms for exact calculations. So there's an important difference there. But one of the other things that's striking about this is, and Ansari talks a bit about it towards the end of his article, his kind of survey article, um, is this issue of learning of words. Because one of the things that's important, particularly in uh, Western uh, teaching of number and maths, is that children tend to acquire number words before they acquire the actual, actual ability to do anything with them. Right. Now, it's not obvious. There's quite a lot of, and sorry, again, talks a bit about this towards the end. It's not obvious that all cultures do that in quite the same way. In other cultures... Um, kids are introduced to things like an abacus, so China, for example, and Japan. Children are introduced to an abacus, so they gain a different kind of route to understanding discrete numbers than we do in the West. We tend to do it by acquiring representations, either Arabic numerals or number words, and we learn to write them down. But in other cultures, it's not so obvious that they acquire it in quite the same way. So one of the things that's an arg another kind of argument in the literature is whether there's some diversity in... Hi, guys. That's all right. Whether there's some... So I've just, I'm just running through a bit of the background. We've just been talking about the uh, difference between an innate intuitive sense of number and quantity and how that differs from an acquired symbolic or discrete system that um, allows us to be able to do perform mathematical computations. Right? So the other thing I was just saying there was that there's, there may well be some cultural diversity in the ways that we acquire the capacities to do discrete maths. Um, and that might actually affect some of the processing that goes on in different regions of the brain, right? And that's the kind of thing that Ansar is talking about just at the end of his paper. So some of the early kind of brain scanning work and um, behavioral work that was done by Dahan, for example, tried to show that if you give different kinds of 
calculations to um, people uh, when doing an, F doing an fMRI scan, then you find different kinds of activations. Right? So if you give them uh, the approximate style, if you gave them something like the 34 plus 47 equals 268, you get activations like this, which are mostly pari pari parietally based. Right? But if you give them exact um, calculations, then you tend to find less parietal activation and much more left frontal activation. So that's associated with, for example, um, word associations, word knowledge of words, for example. Right. So proximate calculations, right image, and verbal representations of numbers are processed primarily front left. So there's a so on the on these early kind of studies, the importance to note is a difference between um, the regions that are activated for approximate judgments and for much more precise, discrete judgments. And so one way to think about this that was suggested is to think in terms of a kind of triple code model. So you've got parietally based analog magnitude system that can do comparison and estimation. You've got an auditory ver verbal word frame where children learn arithmetic facts like two plus four equals six, friends of 10 as, or 20 as they're now known. Uh, and then you've got a, you've got a, uh, system for recognizing the number form, right? Which is probably going to overlap with the so-called visual word form area for recognizing letters. It'd be the same kind of area. And that those three together form a kind of um, numerical cognition type system. So the difference is gonna be that before you learn symbolic maths, number systems and so on, you've got something like this. But once you start being introduced to numbers and to algorithms, operations like addition, then these two start to come into play. And then they have to connect up in an interesting way. So one way that has been quite popular of thinking about this is to think of this in a kind of dual systems type way of thinking. It's famous in the work of people like Kahneman in psychology. So we've got a fast, intuitive, approximate, ancient number system that gives us the intuitive sense of mathematical quantity. And then we have an acquired, right? So this is largely innate. And we have an acquired discrete number system which is slow, symbolic, exact, allows for precise calculations. It's deliberate. You have to you know, work it out either in your head or you have to do it on the page. But the thing that's supposed to happen in, the, in this way of thinking about the two systems is that the symbols in the discrete number system map onto quantities in the ancient number system. That's something that Dahan has been pushing for a long time now. And Quite a few others, including Susan Carey, for example, who um, is a psychologist at Harvard. However, right, so this is where there's disagreement that has emerged perhaps a bit more recently after the consensus type view. The, um, there have been quite a few studies that show that that might not really be quite as simple and obvious as it seems. It looks like a good story and seems to fit with quite a lot of the data. However, as is often the case, there's also a bunch of data that shows something different. And that's where the likes of Ansari, Lyons, Bylock come in. So they introduce this idea called symbolic estrangement. This is really quite recent, this is in the last few years. So the, the Han type studies go right back to 
15 or 16 years ago, right? So that's been going on for a long time. So the argument that you get in uh, from Ansarian colleagues is that there's a kind of a growing estrangement between symbols and the magnitude style representations in the ancient number system, the largely parietally based ones, right? So what happens is that the more symbolic knowledge you gain, the less um, you rely on the ancient number system. The more mathematical knowledge you gain, the more abstract that is, the less mappable the symbolic representations are onto magnitude representations in the ancient number system. So they reckon that the reason for that is because as you get further and further into maths, you tend to get symbol to symbol mappings rather than symbol to magnitude mappings or approximate quantity mappings. Right. So it's a point of contention here. Um, is there a direct, direct mapping of symbols to quantities in the mental number line? Well, maybe not if we're thinking about very abstract type numbers or very large numbers, 10 million, for example. Might not be the case that that obviously maps to a representation in the parietal cortex. So their suggestion is perhaps the mapping, the suggested mapping of the DNS to the ANS starts out developmentally. That's the way things start out because that's the way children start. They start with small numbers and they move upwards from there. So start start out with perhaps it's entirely right that um, there's this mapping that um, that happens. But at a certain point of sophistication the mature system splits into two related but not entirely overlapping systems. So the ANS and the DNS. And as Ansari po points out in a couple of places, that's because the neural circuitry that becomes part of the discrete number system is much more tightly tuned, right? It doesn't have that noisiness and that stochasticity in it. So um, the neurons are much, much more tightly tuned to particular quantities or numbers. Right? And in that sense, there's no direct mapping. And 10 million. So the other kind of option is to say, well, um, perhaps the two systems overlap to a certain degree, but the discrete number system probably overshoots to some extent, to some large extent, the ancient number systems. So partially overlapping, but the more knowledge you get, the more abstract it is, and the less of a map there is between the symbols and the ancient number system. And so those kind of effects that we looked at earlier tend to be less um, apparent the more abstract you get. And that's because your knowledge then is really of the, the kind of relations between numbers in an abstract sense. Okay, so that's what's going on in the, um, the background of the Ansari article, right? So he's looking at a lot of detail of the studies, but the background argument is an argument about whether we ought to think of um, our symbolic mathematical capacities is largely being mappable onto something which is inherited, a kind of number sense or number module, or whether that's what we start out with and that eventually our knowledge and our cognitive processing outstrips and outgrows that and becomes qualitatively different. So the point that's important for Ansari et al. is that it's qualitatively different and that at that point you are also likely to get all kinds of diversity effects in terms of the cultural educational route that you've gone um, with regard to learning a number system, learning mathematics. So let me put this uh, more strongly. We're back to the idea that if you're, um, if you're on the Dahan and Carey end of things, you tend to think that there's something more like a domain-specific inherited module 
which really constrains how your mathematical capacities develop, right? It has a bunch of well understood features that have been widely tested, right? Um, so there's that kind of idea. Now, if the Ansari style idea is right, then actually what we really would think of as arithmetical and mathematical cognition is something that is much more a process of enculturation and education rather than being tightly constrained by an innate domain specific module. So although that may well be the Kickstarter, it's not really um, constraining what we can do with symbols. What we end up doing with symbols isn't really anything like those basic capacities that we have um, when we're children, or that we may have homologously with other primates and even other animals. So that's the um, that's what's going on in the in the mathematics debate. Now the writing debate is also um, fairly straightforward in this sense. Writing systems have not been around very long. First of all, the development of writing systems is very, very re recent. Real writing systems, at most, about three to 4,000 BCE, not very long ago at all. And of course, literacy as a widespread phenomenon is exceptionally recent in the last 100 years or so. Um, so the idea that there could be a gene for reading and writing uh, and that there are, there's a dedicated module in the brain for reading and writing is highly unlikely, right? On any good evolutionary account of cognition. Pretty much everyone agrees with this. Dehan agrees with it. He says it right. Dehan and Cohen, right at the beginning of that article, they say it. Almost everyone thinks that. Um, then there's a kind of puzzle, which is that, well, look, if you thought that you had to have kind of domain-specific regions of the brain dedicated to performing and acquiring certain kinds of capacities, then how the hell could we learn to read and write? Well, the answer is that we just shift over certain functions that already exist in the brain that are close enough. So this is Dehan's view. He calls it neuronal recycling. And it's in the ballpark of the Anderson style approach to reuse. You'll remember the article from last week, he talks about the Hahn. But there are some important differences, I think. Um, the Hahn is fairly strong on certain, certain issues with regard to neuronal recycling. Now, one of the things about neuronal recycling is that it, it seems to require that the brain is quite plastic. So here's a quote from a um, 2014 uh, paper in uh, Mind and Language. So one of the background papers I put up was a paper, my paper from that special issue, which was on the Hans reading model. There are also papers by other people, Macquarie, um, Max Coulthard, Anne Castles, Greg Downey in anthropology. Um, so it's worth going to have a look at. And the Han has a nice piece where he responds to each of us and also does a bit more kind of backgrounding of the issues. But this is a useful quote where he's talking about the role of plasticity. So he says, we're compelled to conclude that the brain is both highly plastic and highly constrained, simultaneously capable of creating an enormous variety of cultural systems and yet acquiring them within tightly defined circuits. Right. So on the one hand, he's acknowledging plasticity and he's, in, he's acknowledging cultural variation, but he's saying something about the brain which seems to conflict with that, which is the brain, neural circuitry is tightly defined. What circuits do is tightly defined, so effectively genetically determined. Um, even beyond the reading domain, I agree that there is a remarkable tension between behavioral observations of seemingly 
seemingly is a qualifier there, domain general plasticity and brain imaging observations of constrained circuitry. Resolving this tension is perhaps one of the most significant riddles facing contemporary cognitive neuroscience. So Dahan thinks that uh, there is a tension here, tension between the idea of neural plasticity, cultural variation, domain general plasticity, being open to a variety of different kinds of environments, the kind of phenotypic plasticity idea that we looked at via um, Sterelny, and the idea that the brain, in terms of what it does, in terms of its regions and in terms of ne inherited neural circuitry, is pretty constrained in terms of what it does. That doesn't look like it fits together very well. He admits that. His, can I, can I just ask, yeah. When he says, I agree with Inari, yeah. uh, which, uh, that's not in one of the papers, is it? It's not in one of the papers. It's a different one, right? It's a different one, yeah. Okay. But he's responding to that paper. Okay. Yeah. It, wait, can you give us a date for that paper, just in case we want to look at it? Yeah, it's, it'd be the same volume and date that my paper's in, in mind and language, ah, okay. which is a German. Yeah. yeah. So his um, response is uh, to use this idea of neuronal recycling. So this is from a, um, a different article, actually I think it might be from his book, Reading in the Brain, um, where he defines what it is. So by neuronal recycling, I mean the partial or total invasion of a cortical territory initially devoted to a different function by cultural invention. Neuronal recycling is also a form of reorientation or retraining. It transforms an ancient function, one that evolved for a specific domain in our evolutionary past, into a novel function that is more useful in the present cultural context. So there's still a bit of connecting up to do. Um, the recycling is to take, well, a function that the brain evolved to perform, um, and via some kind of retraining or reorientation, whatever that means, but retraining, say, um, it can be shifted over to a novel function, a novel function that is determined by the cultural context that we find ourselves in. So something about the existing social and cultural environment forces us to shift our functions over to something new. So you can think about this for mathematics. The idea is that we start off with the ancient number system, but we have to recruit in other, other neural circuitry in other regions to be able to perform this weird new task that we've been given, which is to recognize these weird squiggles and all kinds of strange operations on them. Similarly for reading and writing, for reading, we've got areas of the brain which can recognize faces, objects, and so on. So they already do something not too far away from recognizing these kind of weird shapes or other weird shapes. Uh, and they get specialized towards recognizing these new weird symbols which have just recently appeared in historical time, let alone evolutionary time. So any cultural acquisition like reading has to find its neuronal niche. It has to find an area of the brain that's close enough in function, existing function. That's why Dehan keeps talking about constraints. Existing function to be able to be shifted over to the new weird function that's being, uh, that's um, become prevalent in the environment. But, and this is a point that's interesting given some of the readings we've done recently, that means that the brain has to be sufficiently plastic to be reoriented to the new function. And that's perhaps a matter of contention, how much plasticity is required here. In the paper that I uh, wrote, I was suggesting the brain needs to be highly plastic. Right. So you have to have the high degrees of developmental and neural plasticity to be able to get the kind of effects that you see for reading, maths, but also perhaps for social cognition, 
So thinking about the Sterelny article last week, to be able to do the to be able to inherit all this knowledge, all these new practices, all these these new innovations like number systems or writing systems, um, we have to have the kind of phenotypic or in this case neural plasticity to be able to acquire them. Otherwise, they'd be completely useless. And that's one of the reasons why I might think that modern humans, humans of the last 50 to 100,000 years, are quite different to other hominins further back who had tool use but not an awful lot of innovation. And um, indeed, even earlier humans. So there's something really different between us and humans of 100 to 200,000 years ago, at least behaviorally, even if not anatomically. So one of the things that's important about Dehan's position is this last um, in bold bullet point, which is that he says, prior neural constraints exert a powerful influence on cultural acquisition and adult organization. So one of the things we were talking a bit about last week was um, a sort of constructivist idea of whether the brain is equipotent. Any part of the brain can just pick up any function at any time. Well, there are a lot of sort of damage and lesion studies, which I think Louis mentioned one of them, that can show that uh, the brain is good at picking up the slack. But on the other hand, uh, what we find in a lot of fMRI studies is that the same kind of regions pop up in the same kind of tasks. Right? So we tend to find those regions as becoming specialized or at least dominant for certain kinds of activities, even given the kind of Anderson-style redeployment type work. So if that's the case, then the brain isn't kind of unconstrained. It's not this sort of entirely plastic organ that can just do anything at, uh, that you put in front of it. There are going to be constraints on how you acquire. Um, well, it's not just acquisition, actually. The hung goes further. So it's going to, the way the brain works is going to put constraints on how numbers and uh, writing systems evolve. Right, so there are only there are certain properties that he claims are going to be universal across all writing systems. Right? So it's worth looking at Max's article on that because he he says that's not true. So they have a bit of a nice argument about that actually. Um, so I think that you know part of the tension here is between complete and utter unconstrained. So. Dahan picks up on a quote that I quoted of uh, someone else saying that we kind of one of the things that's important about humans is that we're completely open to new innovations all the time. And he says, look, that's wrong. I don't agree with that. But what I was trying to do there was to quote them to show that that's one possible option. And Dahan's option is obviously quite different from that. But anyway, it doesn't matter. The point here is whether we should think of the kind of cultural shifting of cognition to new functions as being constrained by what's already in place, or whether we should think of it as, as really high, highly unconstrained by our biological nature, if you prefer. Um, now, I think that a highly unconstrained version, one that is often popular in certain areas of the humanities and social sciences, is just not going to work. Um, what that means is that you should be able to study the mind or social organizations or history or, or what have you without needing to know anything about biology, neuroscience or evolutionary biology, or etc. I don't think that's going to work. We can discuss that. But on the other hand, if you go to too constrained, too modular and domain specific, it's really hard to explain the flexibility that's required to be able to read, write, do symbolic maths, and as we'll see next week, perhaps even social cognition, right? So there is a tension here, and it does need to be explained. So anyway, here's um, Dehan's model. So Dehan's model is that 
there are regions, there's a region of the brain, and here, the ventral occipital, occipital temporal junction, uh, he calls the visual word form area, that is part of a, a large network that recognizes all kinds of things from faces to objects to abstract shapes like checkerboard shapes, right? This is prior to any reading. So what you find in illiterate adults is that um, these regions are active <coughs> if you give them these kinds of um, stimuli. And those regions are also active even in literate adults. However, once you start, once you've got literacy in place, once you start training children to recognize letters, then a sub-region of that larger region is always active in Dehan's, is Dehan's argument. Dehan's argument is that this particular region, which he calls a visual word form area, is always active when you give children text or adults. So it doesn't matter variable levels of literacy in adults, that area um, is increased. The more letters you give them, the more activation increases in that area. So the difference when you're looking at groups of six-year-olds with variable reading skills, the main difference between them in brain scans is activation in that area, the visual word form area. Right. And uh, Dahan has done quite a lot of work to try and show that um, the activation is cross-cultural. Even Chinese readers and Japanese readers, that area will be activated, even if there are other areas that are also activated that aren't activated in Western readers. Um, and he claims that the visual word form area is also activated in Braille readers, which is also kind of interesting. Now, there's a bit of discussion about this, right? So um, not everyone agrees about that. And it depends on the studies that you look at. So there are quite a few studies that try to sh that think they show that there's quite a lot of difference between English readers, for example, and Chinese readers um, in brain activation. But Dehan thinks that the thing that is always active is the visual word form area, irrespective of what kind of um, where you have an alphabet system or you have a kind of script type system. Um, something like kanji or um, in kanji is Japanese, isn't it? Something like kanji, which is more pictorial. But it's certainly the case that um, Dehan thinks that reading acquisition recruits the visual word form area at the same cortical location. He claims there's sometimes a little bit of difference, like a millimeter difference, but by and large it's in the same region. Some people think a millimeter, millimeter in the brain is a lot of difference. But anyway, that's roughly the claim. So the claim for Dehan is that this area is so good at recognizing kind of the kind of abstract shapes that go into alphabets that it becomes recruited as the point for recognizing this weird stuff. Letters and then words. There's a lot else that has to be active going on in the brain, but this is the point at which reading is acquired, and this is the region that is first recruited for recognizing these symbols. Now, not everyone agrees with that. So um, Price and Devlin have responded. They don't think that the kind of model that you get from Dehan on neural neuronal recycling really works very well because they think that um, reading involves all kinds of different systems, systems for um, recognizing orthography, semantics, phonology. It's distributed across all kinds of hierarchical, topologically hierarchical systems in the brain, and they're not dissociable. Right? So Dehan thinks that if you knock out the visual word form area, you get Alexia style effects. And that means that this is closer to something that looks like a module again. They're saying that's not true. So for them, the visual, the um, ventral occipital temporal neurons, their general purpose analyzes are visual forms that underlie all, I'll just read quick, 
underlie all types of complex visual pattern recognition, not just reading. Even the most selective cells respond to various shape patterns, providing a distributed structural code that is highly generative. That is, different combinations of these coding elements can represent a virtually infinite set of visual objects. So their claim is this just a really powerful domain general visual object recognition system. There's nothing particularly special about it. It's not that um, a particular group of cells, neurons, are recycled to become reading specific. So reading relies on the same neurophysiological mechanisms as any, as any other form of higher order vision. So Dehan, Dehan and Cohen in their paper are responding to this and they're saying no, um, these, this particular group of cells is high, becomes highly specialized to reading. In fact, one of their claims, uh, one of their predictions of the neuronal recycling model is that um, once you learn to read, you get worse at recognizing other kinds of objects. Right? So you should get worse at read, uh, reading, uh, recognizing faces or other kinds of objects if you learn to read, uh, which is a nice, strong prediction. They think that that prediction is borne out by the evidence, but certainly there's dissension there. So, uh, taking um, stock of these um, arguments, strong, stronger sort of line to take would be that there's really not much innate. There's nothing innate that strongly determines learning in these cases, right? So Dehan says there is. So there's no innate learning mechanism that's specialized for learning to read, play the violin, for example, or to master calculus. There's no kind of area or region of the brain that is specialized to learning those things. Now, if that's the case, or things like them, I'm not saying those specifically, things like them. If that's the case, then we've only got powerful domain general learning. We've got powerful domain general learning in highly scaffolded learning environments, right? So the cortex is highly plastic, and one of the things that's important about this plasticity is that it's driven by learning. So the shifting over of circuitry to new functions, the redeployment, the reuse type idea, is driven by learning in these highly structured social environments. So gaining musical skill, reading, writing, complex maths, that's all driven by the environment. So our brains in that sense have to be very open to the nature of the environment. If they weren't, then these kind of things would, would have to be domain-specific and innate, but they're not. So we might think of um, how our, um, the structure of niches determines something about the way that our brains develop in ontogeny in that long period of development that we talked about last week. So we know that tools have been around for a long time. Sorry, the writing's a bit small on this. Uh, but writing, providing narratives, that seems to have affected the way that modern minds have developed. So children, for example, engage in factive narratives very early on. But it's not too long afterwards that they begin to learn how to engage in fictive narratives. They certainly consume them, and eventually they start producing them. So it's probably the case that factive narratives about other minds, so we're just looping to next week here, um, have evolutionary benefits. But fictive narratives may have uh, benefits as well. They might reinforce certain things, learning to interpret motivations, evaluating the reasons for actions of characters, becoming familiar with the connection between an individual's point of view and their actions and so on. So it may be that fictive narratives are useful ways of extending uh, 
historical knowledge into generational handing on pieces of knowledge through fairy tales, for example, encoding knowledge passed on as wisdom from previous generations. And it might not just be, here I'm doing it in terms of fictive narratives, but that might be factive as well in terms of sort of natural history, knowledge of trackways, animal movements, um, animal droppings, tracks and disruptions of the environment so that you can hunt them. That kind of knowledge can be passed on, on in, a, in a narrative sense, but a factive one. So if you grow up in an environment like this, it's more likely that your mind is going to have to adapt to it. Right? Now, once that also involves written narratives, not just oral narratives, then you've got another shift because you also then have to be able to adapt to the actual writing system, to be able to read it and to be able to produce the writing yourself. And that's another shift. So children have got to be able to adapt to this. Their brains have to be plastic enough to adapt to it. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to be effective in environments that are so structured. OK, so that's all I wanted to say. Uh, and I will stop there. Then